Today's episode is brought to you by Curve, a card and digital wallet service. You'll be hearing more about Curve later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. I am joined by Michael Howell, the founder of Cross Border Capital. Michael, great to have you back on Forward Guidance. Great, Jack. Pleased to be here. Great honor. I, Thank you. I'm so happy you're here, Michael. You are the world's foremost expert on the topic that everybody wants to know about, that, and that is liquidity. Uh, it's cash. It's how easy you can enter and exit a position. It is the you know money that's when 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 liquidity is ample, deals get done, things get bought, and when there's no liquidity, that's when asset prices fall. You uh, have been prescient last year in calling off a fall in global liquidity as central banks were reducing their balance sheets. But I understand that you recently have observed a turn, and uh, this is a turning point I think that is really significant. What have you observed, and uh, yeah, what what? How, how, how surprised are you um, by your findings? Okay. Um, first thing to say is that liquidity bottomed uh, on our calculations. We we calculate a, a liquidity index, a global liquidity index, uh, which covers about 90 central banks worldwide. Uh, and fun, and um, let's say countries, private sector liquidity uh, creators across 90 countries. And that index uh, bottomed in October of 2022. Uh, it's beginning to inflect upwards. I don't want to make too much of the case to say that it's rising strongly. It's not, but it is inflecting upwards, and that's what we'd expect. Uh, the liquidity cycle uh, cycles, as the name suggests, uh, it tends to have uh, a frequency of around about six to seven years. That's the normal liquidity cycle in length. And the trough uh, was always slated to be late uh, 2022 with an upturn beginning around about the end of the year and uh, moving through uh, 2023. So in actual fact, we we did say last year that we would have absolute conviction that the liquidity cycle should turn higher um, in 23 and actually through 24. Uh, that's, you know, that that's on track. Um, I think the more uncertain thing is what it actually means for markets and how markets get traction from that, uh, from that increase in liquidity. But October was uh, definitely the inflection point. And it really came from two areas, uh, one being uh, the Federal Reserve and the other being uh, the People's Bank of China. Yeah, we can uh, flash this chart up just of your global liquidity index. And uh, if people are looking for a, a huge surge in the, the, the liquidity, they'll, they'll be somewhat disappointed. Liquidity has gone what from something like 17 to maybe uh, 19, though. It's, it's, it has bottomed, but uh, it's, it's still low. Um, so, yeah, what does that mean for asset prices when you know liquidity is low but but rising? And tell me why are you convinced that it will continue to rise? And then we can get into the the reasons of, of why it's going up. Uh, the People's Bank of China and and the Federal Reserve. Okay, the I mean one has to be clear, and the annotations on the chart hopefully make it clear that inflection points. Um, you know, a positive in, in a medium term sense, but you do get accidents around those lower turning points. Um, and in actual fact, that's one of the things historically that actually spurs the liquidity cycle upwards because central banks come in and actually pour a lot more money into the system. However, uh, we're pretty confident that it's turning now for a number of reasons. I mean, I cited the fact that from a central bank standpoint, you've got the People's Bank of China and you've got the Federal Reserve beginning to put money back into, uh, into the system. The Federal Reserve is probably inching liquidity in which we can discuss a little bit later, but the People's Bank of China is kind of going for it. They're pouring a lot of liquidity into the system. But it's not just central banks that are key here. There are other factors that are also at play. One of those is the fact that the US dollar has begun to, uh, has peaked and is coming down. We, uh, we figured that the dollar would likely see from peak to maybe the lows this year, about a 20% correction. And we guess we're about halfway through that process now. So we still believe very much in a dollar uptrend, but uh, you know things don't, uh, don't move in straight lines. There are cycles and uh, we figured the dollar would have a setback this year. The second thing is that you've also got uh, a peak in oil prices that may turn out to be temporary, but the fact is it's happened. And oil is a very big user of liquidity. Therefore, if the oil price comes back, uh, you tend to find that there's less demand for 
uh, financing in the real economy. And consequently, there's more money for financial markets to use. The third thing that's happening, which I think is a in a way, a, a more important factor, certainly from a longer term perspective, is that bond market volatility has come down. And bond market volatility is very important for the repo market, because if you start to get increasing volatility uh, in uh, collateral markets, of which bonds are clearly a key part, uh, you tend to get credit uh, shrinking. So the fact that bond volatility is coming down uh, means you've got more opportunity for repo financing and that's clearly a very important source of liquidity. So if you add all these factors up, there's a number of positive factors that are leading, leading the liquidity cycle to rise uh, this year. Yes, uh, financial conditions have loosened over the past few months, and that can be seen quite easily by rise in stock market, a, a narrowing in credit spreads. Um, at one time, a, a pricing in of a, a Fed pivot, so a fall in risk-free interest rates, that kind of is... That, story has been put on hold uh, since we had a, a strong labor market, at least in the, in the US. Those are frequently referred to as financial conditions. And those are quite easily observable by uh, you know, you know, any, anyone just who, who looks them up. Your focus on liquidity, which is sort of a primordial uh, uh, force that acts before that, that precedes financial conditions. Uh, so, so let's get into it. The, the Federal Reserve is reducing its balance sheet. So that should be they should be removing liquidity from the system. However, you're noting that they're adding it back somehow. How is it possible that the Federal Reserve can be restoring liquidity at a time where they're supposed to be removing you know, up to $95 billion of liquidity uh, every single month? The fact is that the Fed balance sheet, or let's put it another way, every item that is on the Fed balance sheet is not necessarily liquidity creating uh, or liquidity subtracting. Uh, some uh, factors don't, uh, don't affect liquidity. And what you've got is a situation where the Federal Reserve is publicly um, rolling off treasuries from its balance sheet. And what it wants us to do now, if you listen to the rhetoric, or certainly my interpretation of the rhetoric from Fed governor's speeches, is they want us to focus on the roll off of treasuries to evidence QT. Now, that's not necessarily how a lot of people view QT, is that I, I guess before this process happened, people would have equated QT to reducing liquidity in the system. Now, what you've actually got is a situation where the Federal Reserve may be able to have its cake and eat it here. So they can actually publicly show that treasurers are only off the balance sheet and the balance sheet is shrinking. It's currently 8.4 trillion, but as you rightly say, it could be shrinking at something like 80 billion uh, you know, every uh, month or so. So it's, it's coming down from that perspective. But there are elements on the balance sheet which are uh, affecting, in a different way, the liquidity situation. And a couple of those, for example, to, to cite uh, uh, item lines, would be the Treasury General Account and holdings of reverse repos. There's actually a third, which is the losses, the operating losses that the Federal Reserve is now making, because it's basically paying out more interest uh, than it's actually receiving on uh, in coupon form from the treasurer as it holds. Now, the reverse repo uh, and the treasury general account basically are absorbing liquidity uh, from or actually creating liquidity as they vary uh, on the liability side of the balance sheet. This is all very wonkish, but the bottom line is that liquidity injections by the Federal Reserve uh, over the last three to four months have essentially flatlined at the same time that the balance sheet has fallen. So in other words, as I say, the Fed is basically having its cake and eating it. Now, why is this going on? And the rationale that I would, uh, I would uh, offer goes back to September of last year and the British guilt crisis when the incoming Prime Minister, Liz Truss, uh, uh, engaged a pro-growth budget, uh, which the markets didn't like, and the British sovereign debt market, the gilt market, sold off aggressively. Now, the Bank of England switched with some alacrity from a QT policy overnight uh, to a QE policy to rescue the sovereign debt market. And the fact is that, uh, in fact, the chart you show here is US Treasury market liquidity. But what I've identified on that chart is the British gilt crisis. Now, that arrow is significant because that pretty much marks the low point of liquidity, market liquidity in the treasury market. This is an index that we put together uh, that is a measure of market debt. So it's, in other words, 
the volumes that you can trade and the bid ask spreads, uh, for example, it ranges between zero and 100. It got down to below 10 at the time of the uh, guilt debacle in the UK. Uh, there was obviously a, an infection which uh, spread to other sovereign debt markets. But now that index has raced up and it's trading at over, uh, over 50. So it's well above normal. Bloomberg do a similar index and theirs shows pretty much exactly the same phenomenon. So this happened. Now, why did it happen? The reason being is that volatility in the sovereign debt market is really what the central banks want to correct. Central banks may have a remit right now of trying to tackle inflation and being you know, creating employment growth. But above all, they were originally set up, uh, you know, centuries ago, or in the case of the US, more than just over a century ago, to basically stabilize the sovereign debt market. And that's what they that's their task that they will do, they will fall back to if there are problems. Now, volatility in the British guilt market was not helpful, as many of your listeners will know. But pose the question, had that happened in the US Treasury market, we'd all probably be toast right now, because the US Treasury matters market matters far, far more. It's the most important price in world financial markets. And that would have been devastating had there been volatility. So I suspect what happened is that there was a deliberate, uh, if you like, separation in terms of the Fed's mind between using interest rates to control inflation and nail inflation in the system and the balance sheet, or more specifically, the effective balance sheet, what I call liquidity, is being used for financial stability reasons. Now, we all know, uh, or hopefully we all know, that Japan is the canary in the coal mine here, that everything you have seen in Japan uh, basically is translated with a lag of some years into Western markets. We've had demographic aging demographics, we've had deflation, disinflation, negative interest rates, uh, QE, QT, uh, yield curve control. They're coming to a high street near you. And in many cases, what the Federal Reserve is doing here, in my view, is the beginnings of a yield curve control. They simply cannot let the sovereign debt market sell off or, or get volatility. And that is really the essence of the system. What you've got in, uh, well, in the world financial system now is a very, very complex uh, financial system. There is, there's been a lot of innovation. There are dark holes or dark areas where we don't really know what happens. Um, and it's extremely difficult for the monetary authorities to basically control, regulate, and supply liquidity into those markets when necessary, when you get a crisis. And increasingly, what central banks are going to have to do is to operate uh, at the other end, if you like, by trying to uh, control collateral flows or at least stabilize collateral. So if you get a problem in the financial markets with a lack of liquidity, because of the role of collateral and repo in the system, it makes more sense, if you like, for the monetary authorities to control the treasury market, the treasury market being a major source of pristine collateral in the world financial system. Does that make sense? I want to get in. I, I want to get into the, the plumbing, but before we do, Michael, could you just, uh, you know, as simply as you can, describe how your view that liquidity is back on the rise? How does that well, affect your outlook for risk assets, stocks, uh, uh, gold, crypto, and then how does it impact your outlook on on bonds? Okay, well, let's uh, let let me just continue the story somewhat. So what we're seeing is a gradual inflection in our. Uh, in our indexes of US liquidity. I don't want to go overboard and say this thing is moving up aggressively. It's not, but it's it's turning. And I suspect if you roll out over the next 12 months, uh, that index will be significantly higher in 12 months time than it is now. So I think there's more liquidity coming into the system. Now, I want to explain this because I think it's an important point uh, just before we get on to the implications for markets. The reason that the monetary authorities are fixated on the bond market comes back to this collateral question. And you can evidence their concerns by looking at the level of bank reserves in the US. Now, it's been the view of the New York Fed, who basically uh, conduct open market operations for the Federal Reserve System, that what, you're, what you need is a level of bank reserves of about 
1.9 trillion, or that's been the, the stated figure. Um, currently, US bank reserves are about 3 trillion. Now, the reason that uh, I'm showing the chart, or you're showing the, the our chart uh, now, is that what I've got on that chart are two lines. One is bank reserves in orange, solid line. Then there's the same data, but with a one standard deviation displacement downwards and a dotted line, which has been drawn at about two and a half trillion uh, US dollars. Now that's higher than the 1.9 the US, the New York Fed says. It is a figure very similar to the estimates that we give, which is about 2.6 trillion for a threshold. But the 2.5 actually comes from US academics that in a conference in September, uh, notable academics such as Jonathan Wright uh, came up with the figure of 2.5 being uh, an estimate of what the minimum level of reserves would be for the US financial system to operate in. If you go below that reserve level, you are likely to get refinancing problems in the system and you may get a breakdown of, uh, uh, of the markets. And effectively, what that means is that if you get dislocations in the collateral markets, you get more volatility and more volatility creates even more illiquidity because it means that margin requirements jump. And so you get a cascade downwards of illiquidity and uh, you know, collapsing markets. And therefore, it's very important to keep uh, above that threshold. Now, what's the importance of that one standard deviation? The reason being is that we're in a period now where one of those line items in the Fed balance sheet, the Treasury General account, is likely to be more volatile than normal. And the reason for that is you've got the debt ceiling issue and you've also got seasonality because now is the uh, heavy tax paying uh, period. And so the Treasury General account may be going up significantly, be going down significantly through this period. And as that changes, you're going to impart more volatility into overall money market liquidity and hence bank reserves. And so there is more chance of us falling to that lower one standard deviation bound. And we've got to stay above it. So what you've seen pretty much since the British guilt debacle is that US bank reserves are flatlined uh, around this lower threshold. And I think that is deliberate. Now, that's point number one. And I think that's going to continue. We may be getting more liquidity in the system as well for various technical reasons over coming months. So think of this as a separation. This is all for financial stability reasons. It is not because the Fed thinks it's beaten inflation. Uh, the inflation uh, target uh, or the policy targets for inflation are much more likely to be keeping Fed funds rates at a high level for longer. So the Fed is not, uh, you know, not uh, easing back on its inflation remit. Uh, it's still dedicated to try and hit the 2% target, but it's going to use rates to do that. Throw in as well what China has done. China is clearly very important to the world financial system. Um, China, for a long time through last year, 2022, basically embarked on a tight monetary policy. It was doing that because the yuan was itself under pressure in the forex markets, and they had a previous or prior target to try and stabilize the yuan dollar cross. Uh, they ultimately gave up on that late last year. You've now had the COVID reopening. The People's Bank of China has begun to spur the economy with more liquidity injections. And what they did in December and in January was to inject something like 3 trillion yuan, so about $450 billion, uh, into uh, Chinese financial markets. Now, to put that in context, that represents about somewhere between three and three and a half times the total amount they injected in the prior two years. So they are going for it. It's very unlikely they'll be able to keep this pace up um, at the current rate, but you're still seeing a liquidity boost and liquidity is likely to rise through this year. And that is very important when it comes to understanding the momentum of the world economy, simply because the People's Bank controls the tempo of the Chinese economy uh, very closely. The Chinese economy is the elephant in the room we know in the world economy. And what you're likely to see is as a result of that, commodity markets uh, continuing to pick up. And in fact, if you look at a chart of commodity prices, uh, which I think is in the pack, you'll see it moves or they move remarkably closely uh, with uh, People's Bank liquidity injections. The chart here, exactly that. 
Now, there's a strong correlation between these two indexes. And what we show is the orange line here is Chinese People's Bank liquidity injections. And you can see that that is moving up or has moved up. The dotted line, dotted orange line, is basically what we project that will be looking at the current rate of liquidity injection that the PBOC is undertaking. The black line is CRB commodity prices, year on year change. Uh, and the dotted black line is the same index excluding energy. So you can see that the cycle moves very closely with what Chinese stimulus is doing. Uh, and the orange line, by the way, has been advanced on that chart. So what you're seeing is a significant unfolding or rising of liquidity in the system. One other heads up that we need to uh, also explore is what about crypto? And crypto, uh, as I said, sort of, uh, you know, late last year, uh, when we first uh, you know, had this inkling of the liquidity cycle turning, is that, you know, number one, this is not an investment recommendation, let me say again, but all I note is that crypto is an extremely good monetary barometer. Uh, in other words, it's a hedge against monetary inflation, uh, what gold always used to do, but, uh, you know, crypto does maybe rather better now. So if you believe that this liquidity cycle is turning, then crypto prices are going to are going to rise. And in fact, on our Twitter feed, uh, which is at cross border cap, uh, we recently put a chart up there which showed uh, an index of um, uh, or our liquidity, uh, our liquidity index alongside uh, the growth in monetary inflation, um, or assets which uh, react to monetary inflation which is a weighted average of gold and uh, crypto. And it's almost one for one. So if you believe that liquidity is going up, uh, those are areas to invest in. Now, that may be a very good segue into how the markets will move through this year. The first thing to say, above all, is that liquidity leads financial markets and financial markets lead the real economy. We do not use... Uh, the real economy to predict financial markets, we use financial markets to predict and understand the real economy. Um, and that's, you know, an important point to make. I believe it was Stan Druckermiller, the legendary US investor, who said that the best economist is the internals of the stock market. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you, if you evidence what he said, statistically, you can see that's absolutely uh, spot on. Now, this particular year, 2023, to our mind, looks remarkably like 2001 or the 2001-2002 cycle coming out of the Y2K bubble. OK, so there is a parallel there. And the chart you can see in front of you, the orange line is that template from the 97 to 2003 cycle. And the blue line is the latest cycle. And it looks absolutely on track. OK, now, you know, <laughs> let's uh, let's be certain that it probably won't be. Uh, it will be precisely wrong in the event, but uh, it could be approximately right. And that's what we've got to kind of figure. Now, what happened in 2001 too? what you saw was the government bond markets being decent uh, performers through the year, but not, um, you know, not uh, they weren't very strong. In actual fact, it was the corporate credit markets that performed much better, uh, particularly junk towards the end of the year, although there were very special reasons why junk looked cheap, uh, you know, with hindsight at that time. And maybe it's less true now uh, in the US markets, and maybe a lot of the investment grade or even straying into high yield looks a little bit better value. Then what you started to see were commodity markets, particularly in the second half of the year, picking up strongly. Um, and um, equities began to get traction, but it was really 2002, the following year, before equities really started to make gains. Now, we've got to be clear here that there was the tragedy of 9-11 interspersed between those two years, which clearly must affect the timing um, or affect the historic timing. But I think in terms of the sequencing, that's where you've got to start to look at. And it took some time before the economy began to pick up. Uh, but there may, as I say, be special reasons why that why that was the case. But that's this is the sort of outlook that we're looking at this time around. Now, the other thing to say, which is important in this context, is that China 
was a very different vehicle, uh, you know, 20 years ago. It was only just really coming into the world economy in 2001. They've been the uh, uh, entry was allowed uh, at the end of that year uh, through uh, into WTO. Uh, China was allowed into the world trading system, trade trade organization, and so that that made a that made a difference to subsequent years. China is much more important today, and the way that we figure it is that if you very crudely, and this is a huge, huge simpler simplification, but it may be useful, is that think of the equity market as having two moving parts: a PE multiple and an E. Mm-hmm. The PE uh, is uh, sorry, earnings. E is market. earnings, and PE is price to earnings ratio. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Exactly. And so the the PE is made in America, if you like, through the Federal Reserve and liquidity. Let's think of it in those terms. And the E is made in China, and that's because China has such a big influence on the world economy. It is the elephant in the room. So what you've got are these two power plays between these two elements. And I think what you've got this time around is that if China is genuinely easing liquidity and stimulating its economy, earnings may get a much bigger uplift in the world economy than many people are thinking right now. And so you could be seeing an improvement in PEs because of the Fed and an improvement in earnings coming through because of China. But let me stress, early days yet, and let's not be, you know, let's not get too carried away, but these are the things to look at. So, you know, we tend to do our investing by looking at liquidity. We look for uh, evidence and corroborating evidence by looking at sequences of events. And we look at charts to see whether you're getting the breakouts that we would expect. Uh, But we're not really drilling into economic data and saying, you know, we predict the US economy is going to be 3.2%, you know, in fourth quarter, uh, 2023. I don't think you make money out of those sort of statements. Mm, right. So liquidity precedes price action. You noted that liquidity bottomed somewhere around the fall of last year. That's where the stock market bottomed in the US. That's where the Chinese stock market bottomed. Uh, the Chinese equity market has been on an absolute roar uh, over the past three months. And uh, looking at your chart of liquidity, it's, uh, you know, you can you can see a, a relationship there uh, for sure. You're saying liquidity is back. That is bullish. Oh, oh, your crypto, not investment advice. Uh, it tra- tracks liquidity. However, let me just uh, actually just put this chart back up of Fed liquidity uh, now from 2019 uh, 2019 to 2025 uh, relative to Fed liquidity from 1997 to 2003. If uh, if let's say 2025 is the equivalent of 2003, didn't the didn't the Nasdaq not bottom until late 2002 or maybe even 2003? And wouldn't that mean that the bear market, you know, if if we're sort of mapping the the stock indices on each other instead of liquidity, uh, didn't the bear market, you know, wasn't the Fed liquidity from your chart was was put in in 2002? That didn't uh, necessarily help the equity market for a for a, you know a, a year or so, right? Correct. But I think what you've, um, uh, you know, every cycle is different. Um, And I think that what you've got to look at, as I say, is the sequencing. So if you've got um, uh, if you've got evidence that, number one, uh, bond volatility is falling. okay, that's suggesting that you're moving to a different type of framework in the bond markets. Uh, Then you're starting to get corporate bonds performing. You're getting. Uh, spread compression in the corporate markets, then you're starting to see commodity prices moving up. Um, Those are all factors that would tend to suggest we're on track, right? Now, it may be that the lead time between uh, liquidity moving and the equity market is shorter this time, or maybe it is the same as you correctly say occurred in 2002. But there were two things that were different about 2002 or 2001 too. One was, as I said, there was the tragedy of 9-11, which may well have disrupted things. Um, You know, that's obviously a a debating point. And the other question is that you didn't have China operating in the same way as it's operating now. And the Chinese cycle is coinciding, or the Chinese earnings cycle is now coinciding with this uh, lift that we're getting maybe from Western central banks. Okay, that makes sense. And so a lot of the liquidity when it comes to central banks, you're talking about the balance sheet, not rates. However, I think the fall in 
interest rate volatility that allows people to, to take on larger positions and then uh, amplifies liquidity does have to do with the fact that the bond market is no longer pricing in uh, the, the implied volatility in the bond market is is lower because the Federal Reserve is closer to the peak rate. We don't know where it is, and they're still pricing a lot of cuts. But there's less uncertainty now on rates than there was in uh, a year ago. That's for sure. Yeah, I think that's right. Now, I think the you know the other thing to say as a heads up is that you know we've spent much of the I'm saying we collectively have spent much of the last twenty years focusing on things like the VIX index, which is equity market volatility. And I think what we've got to increasingly look at is bond market volatility measured by indexes, uh, implied volatility indexes like the move index, uh, which is a measure of volatility across the yield curve. Michael, given that, uh, yeah, do, do you think that equities bottomed in October or, you know, they, they, we're close to a bottom in June. I, you know, stock market is way higher now than it was on the day of the first 75 basis point hike in, in June, which is really remarkable to think about. Um, and you know, if equities have bottomed, are you forecasting a you know a new bull market like the the type that began in April of 2020, where it just shot up like a rocket ship, or is it more of a sort of choppiness? My view is for this year that what you'll see is basically the uh, the major stock and bond markets effectively range bound for this through this year but unlike 2022 where we lost money or you know one could have lost money everywhere pretty much what you're going to see is some major outperformances this year so you can make money in certain sectors in other words choosing where you invest is critical and i would suggest that the areas that look attractive within the equity markets are going to be things like emerging markets. Why? Because China is easing for the first time in some years. I mean, arguably, it's easing the most aggressively it's been since 2015. Um, you've got the dollar, which is coming down, and you've got commodity markets which are rising. All those factors make emerging markets one of the best investment er one of the best uh, investment areas, uh, you know, looking ahead in, in a way they haven't really, they haven't shone for almost a decade now. So what you've got is a lot of opportunity there. I think you'll make money as well, uh, you know, in things like uh, commodity related and cyclicals. Now, the cyclicals is clearly a controversial point because if we're wrong and you get recession, then uh, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be badly affected by that. But I would suspect that those are the sort of areas to look at this year. But generally, I think the markets are going to be range bound, and I also believe that's true of, of government bond yields. Now, the government bond yield question uh, would suggest that you may be better off, or that statement about bonds, you may be better off in the corporate markets, where you've probably got higher yields, and you've got the possibility of some, some spread compression as well. So I think that, you know, certainly, you can't dismiss the attractions at the front end of the curve, with cash, you know, yielding what it's doing. But I think equally, you know, moving into corporate debt is, you know, makes, makes a lot of sense to me. Hey there, I hope you're enjoying today's show. Just wanted to let you know that this episode is sponsored by Curve, a payment service that gives you power over your finances. The way it works is that Curve is an extra layer on top of your credit and debit cards that gives you additional cash back on the rewards that you're already earning. Curve Card has no foreign transaction fees and you can choose to earn your rewards in crypto. You don't have to, but you have the option. Curve Card also has a feature called Go Back in Time, where you can retroactively change the card used to buy an item after you made the purchase, up to 30 days after, actually. A key concept in finance is optionality. When you have the option to do something, but you don't have to do something, this can be very valuable in finance as well as life. And optionality is exactly what Curve gives you to do with your wallet. So check out Curve to get $20 once you've downloaded the app and made your first transaction. Curve Card is powered by Hatch Bank. Terms and conditions apply. Now, let's get back to the interview. And I want to ask you about uh, how confident are you that this liquidity cycle will continue in a historical pattern, i.e. once it's bottomed and liquidity has gone from 17 to 20, it will go from 20 to 25, from 25 to 35, 35 to 45, and then it, it goes to, you know close to 100, and then it peaks over again, because it seems like uh, not so much the People's Bank of China liquidity, as well as Bank of Japan, which I want to ask you about, we haven't talked about. Um, but it seems like this uh, Federal Reserve uh, sterilization of quantitative tightening, uh, is it, to use a dangerous word, uh, transitory? And also, 
uh, when you've talked about that, you you use words that are intentional, as if oh, the Federal Reserve is offsetting this balance sheet. It's you know, it's letting um, its assets roll off, so which which decreases reserves in the system. However, inert assets from the reserve repo facility are also going to the banking system. So it's net net. And we saw that flat line of the banking reserves. But uh, what gives you confidence that this is an intentional policy of the Federal Reserve versus this is just how things you know happen? Yields are, are now at you know four and a half percent. People want to buy treasuries. And there was this you know huge uh, amount of uh, frozen capital in the reverse repo facility, which is basically uh, somewhat like a deposit facility where uh, people can park uh, uh, reserves to quote lend to the Federal Reserve, not as if the Federal Reserve you know needs uh, to, to borrow. It's it's purely a, a fiction, a, you know, a, a, a manufactured facility. How confident are you that this is intentional? Uh, the Federal Reserve is is trying to offset and specifically target the the level of bank reserves in the system. Well, the, to answer the 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 first question is how confident are we that the liquidity cycle picks up now? Um, you know, is it a normal cycle? I, my view would be I'm 100% confident that we're going to see rising liquidity over the next two years. Yes, okay. How confident am I that this is a deliberate policy by the Federal Reserve to inch liquidity into the system uh, to try and restore or control liquidity in the bond markets? I'm not confident, no. That's my interpretation as an analyst. That's what I think is going on. Uh, but, you know, as they say, if it's yellow and quacks, it's a duck. So I think we've got to be pretty you know, pretty confident that's happening. And otherwise, how do you explain the rise in market liquidity in the bond markets? Uh, you know, the fact that you've got declining bond market volatility and that uh, US bank reserves have kind of flatlined over the last few months um, in a way that wouldn't be expected. So I think all those, you can tick all those boxes. I think looking longer term, what the Federal Reserve would like to see would be to see its balance sheet shrinking but bank reserves in the in the system remaining high and maybe rising. And the only way they can get that really is to allow the reverse repo system or force the reverse repo uh, balances to actually reduce significantly. That can be done, but that has to be done in conjunction with what the Treasury is doing. Uh, and that may be you know, clearly in the short term hampered by the debt ceiling. Uh, and also in terms of uh, how they adjust short term rates and uh, what they're doing with uh, you know rates on reverse repos versus uh, Fed funds rates, et cetera. So there's a lot there can be a lot of manipulation, but I think basically what you'd expect to see is that that reverse repo pot, which is about two point what four trillion now, uh, will reduce significantly over the next two years. You cited three sort of asterisks to to general liquidity of the, of the balance sheet for the Federal Reserve. Uh, one is, the Treasury General account, which as its checking account for the government, which as it goes down, money is going into the system, a, a, a private, uh, a, a public deficit becomes a private surplus. Uh, mm -hmm. The second is the reverse repo facility, which we just talked about. And the third is uh, the Federal Reserve's gains or losses on its securities. Now the, the Federal Reserve is earning significantly less on the assets it holds, such as treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, earning much less on those than it's paying out in the reverse repo and other uh, of its liabilities. How many, uh, how would you weigh the importance of those three factors? Which, which is the most important? Well, the, the, the most important in terms of, uh, of um, week to week or month to month fluctuations is the treasury general account, because we are in a period where, uh, as I said, there's, you know a lot of seasonal inflow and you've got the debt ceiling which means that new uh new debt can't be raised um so it's that's going to be volatile in the near term in the longer term it's less of a factor because what you've also got to take into account is the size of the reverse repo tranche which is 2.4 trillion out of a balance sheet of 8.4 so if you eliminated the reverse repo uh, that wouldn't necessarily affect bank reserves, but it would cause the uh, it would basically cause the balance sheet to effectively to, or allow the balance sheet to come down by about two and a half trillion. So the balance sheet could get back to uh, six trillion very quickly if they if they rolled that off. Um, so that that is the ideal world for sure. And then you've got to take into account the operating losses, which you know are, are, you know they're important now, but they're accumulating. And what you may see for the full year is perhaps $150 billion of operating losses, uh, which is effectively money printing for the system. 
it, it seems to me that in you know March 2020 and April 2020, when the Federal Reserve just printed an, a ton of money, apologize to my you know listeners who uh, take offense at the word you know print money, but uh, th- that there was no ceiling. You know, one trillion dollars, why not? Two trillion dollars, why not? But it's, it's, it seems to me that on the Treasury General account, it's uh, now at what 400? Yeah, almost almost half a trillion dollars. So as that yeah. draw down draws down to zero, uh, you know that's a lot of money, 500 billion dollars in the system. But uh, at, at some point. The debt ceiling will have to be raised, and and the, the TGA will have to go back up. So, is there sort of a a, a cap on how uh, much liquidity can go in, into the system? Well, the the answer is that the the Treasury have indicated that, um, as far as I, I recall, that that Treasury general account could get down to uh, sub one hundred billion. Okay, that that's potent, that that's possible. I think in terms of their their math. Uh, where they're more comfortable with it and where the targets once were was 700 billion. So you can see that where we are now, which is a, a short 500 billion, uh, you know, we could go down 400 and we could go up, uh, you know, another two or 300. So you've got a lot of volatility potentially on the balance sheet from that item. But that's a short term volatility and it is it pales against uh, the you know potential size or loss uh, of uh, liquidity from the reverse repo. I mean that, that's a that's a bigger that's a much much bigger element. Where, uh, what other central banks are meaningfully impacting liquidity, and is it a positive or a negative uh, drawdown? I know the European Central Bank, I, I believe, has it begun quantitative tightening. I, I should know that. And then the Bank of Japan is its is its own animal. Well, uh, I mean, the okay. Let, let's let's look at these in turn. Um, the the Bank of England and uh, the European Central Bank are undertaking uh, QT. I mean, they're they're shrinking their balance sheets for sure. In terms of the amount of liquidity in the global system, that doesn't really matter hugely. Uh, it's you know, I mean, one can't dismiss it, but it's not really the the main engine. And I would suspect that they will come into line uh, anyway with what's happening in the bigger economies or the bigger central banks of the Fed. And to some extent, the People's Bank, uh, Japan is uh, is a less important central bank than it was 20 years ago. But uh, in principle, but the amount of money that the Japanese are creating is actually uh, you know eye watering, and um, you know this is having an impact on global liquidity for sure. But so you've got a lot of the liquidity creation. Uh, at the margin now coming from Asia, coming from Asian central banks. Now I want to ask you about another uh, call you make, which is that the yield curve might be giving a distorted and uh, false signal for a deep recession. So the, the yield curve is deeply inverted, something close to 80 basis points on the, uh, the 210 spread. Uh, that's indicating that a recession is on the horizon. Now, when the yield curve inverts, that does not mean we're in a recession. It means that it it likely is coming, and there there can be a, a very long delay, as as long as two or even uh, more years between when the curve first inverts and, w- and when it comes. But the last time you you came on, that you said this was an ominous signal for the global economy that the yield curve was inverted. Uh, it, it seemed like you you've now you've you've changed your your mind. Uh, what led you to change your mind? Well, I think not not necessarily. I think the I think what to, to be to be accurate, what I said was that the uh, the yield curve is a flaky predictor, but you know what you've got is the inversion is telling you something about tightness of liquidity, and uh, uh, some years ago I wrote a it was an academic paper in uh, in the Journal of Fixed Income that was looking at the efficacy of the yield curve as a predictor of uh, upcoming recessions, and the answer is that the yield curve uh, generically has 100% track record. But the problem is, is that any particular maturity spread, be it the uh, 10 to the three month, 10 year, the 5 10 spread, whatever the three year, one year, uh, any one of those tends to work better in each different. Uh, recessionary period. So in other words, if you look at the 10-2 specifically, it works in some recessions, it doesn't work in others. If, if you look at the three one-year spread, that works in some recessions, it doesn't work in others. So basically, the conclusion is that what you've also got to take into account is another sort of wonkish bond market concept, which is convexity. And that tends to be uh, a critical factor as well. So where are we now in terms of uh, of what the yield curve is saying? 
The yield curve, as you rightly say, is very in, uh, inverted. Should we be paying attention to that? We should be paying attention, but we should be qualifying what's going on. And the problem is that alongside the yield curve inverting, what you have in the US, and for that matter in other economies too, is deeply negative term premia on long dated bonds. Now, and explain what that is, please, Michael. <laughs> I shall. But this yeah. is the you know this is the time for wet towels around the head and yeah. uh, sort of deep thinking. So it's a bit wonkish again. So <clears throat> if you think of the if you think of the bond market and a bond yield, the bond yield consists of two moving parts. One is interest rate expectations. So in other words, a ten year bond has an interest rate uh, expectation component, which is the expected average of policy rates, Fed funds rate, over that 10-year horizon. But on top of that, there's another element, which is called the term premia, which is a discount or a premium, as the name suggests, for interest rate risk. In other words, for the uncertainty of interest rate movements over that period. And that term premia is a bigger and bigger component of longer and longer dated yields. So as you move out along the yield curve from one year through 10 year, the term premium becomes a much, much bigger weighting in your yield calculation. Now, why is that important? Because at the moment, you've got uh, for a 10 year bond in the US, 10 year treasury, you've got a negative term premium and you've got the most negative you've ever had, right? So in almost 60 years of data, uh, not just done just look at our data, but look at the New York Fed's uh, ACM calculation, um, what that shows is very negative term premium. Now, why is that going on? It's going on because you've got a shortage of collateral in the global financial system. And collateral or pristine collateral are US treasuries and things like German government bonds, right? The shortage of collateral, which is used for repo lending, derivative markets or whatever, is causing uh, a bid for these uh, safe assets, these treasuries. And therefore, they've got a negative term premium. And that term premium is reflecting those supply demand imbalances, if that makes sense. So the fact you've got a big negative term premium means there's excess demand for 10-year treasuries. If you did not have that um, negative term premium, the 10-year bond would currently be yielding about 5% or so, right? But the negative term premium means you as an investor, you've got to pay away to the market a discount of that amount. Um, without that, uh, as I say, yields will be higher. Now, think about what that means for the yield curve, is if the front end of the yield curve, the one two-year bond, has a very small term premium, and the 10-year has a big term premium, and it's very negative, what that's doing is imparting a huge negative displacement uh, in other words, it's creating a bigger inversion than you would normally suspect is around. So I'm not saying that the yield curve is not inverted or uh, wouldn't be inverted. What I'm saying is nothing like as inverted as the reported numbers would suggest. And what that inversion tells us more about is financial uh, fragility, not economic fragility, in my view. So I'm not saying the economy won't slow down. Uh, a lot of the cyclical components of the American economy are softening clearly, and they'll they will get momentum, downward momentum, and the economy may well, uh, you know, hit recession. But it's going to be nothing like as bad, in my view, that the yield curve is currently signaling. So, your interpretation of the negative term premium is that there is a excess demand for uh, longer term collateral, U.S. Treasury securities, uh, bonds. How do you uh, then view the immense sell-off in? longer dated securities of, of 2022, you know, looking at, let's say, uh, TLT's performance in 2022, or, you know, long term government bonds, wherever, wherever you go, uh, they performed very, very poorly. So uh, was there just a, I guess, is it an excess demand uh, for duration relative to the demand for um, shorter term things? Or, or you know, so how, how do you explain that? Well, the, I mean, the answer is that the term premium has uh, latterly got a lot more negative. Right uh, after the after bond market stabilized, but most of the reason that bonds were on on this analysis, most of the reason that the bond bond yields went up was rate expectations, not the term premium. Right, it was because basically people were factoring in that the Fed would keep interest rates higher for longer, which it looks like they're likely doing. Ten-year Treasury note uh, 
the term premium in that would be the yield on a 10-year treasury note relative to the sort of weighted average of uh, the, the, the one month treasury futures for all the, uh, 120 months between now and 10 years from now. Right. Yeah. That, that's how you, you, that's how you would count. You would basically try and calculate it, but effectively what that, what it's saying is that if you, if you assume that fed funds will average 5%, uh, over the next 10 years, uh, what you would expect under normal circumstances is the 10 year bond would yield in a perfect market 5%. But it doesn't. It yields three and a half. So either in, either uh, interest rate expectations uh, are, are, are falling, right? But they're not falling to that extent. Or, which is the reason, the term premia is very negative, and that's the reality. So estimates of term premia, which you can do, which is a you know highly mathematical calculation, which I, I'm not going to go into here. Uh, but just look at the website of the New York Fed. Uh, and they calculate term premium every day, and it's called the ACM calculation. Mm. Uh, a, a related point to an inverted yield curve is the cuts being priced into the Fed funds futures curve or the, the SOFR curve, which you know show okay, we think that the Fed will get to five point two percent in you know the spring of this year, but after that, it's it's cutting, 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 cutting. Uh, a, a sort of simple interpretation of that is the Federal Reserve would cut because there would be a recession and uh, the, the, the financial system would, would require support, uh, not just the balance sheet, which you, know, you focus a lot on, but, but in addition as, as rates. Uh, do you have a different interpretation as to why rate cuts are being priced into the market, number one? And number two, do you think they are right? Uh, do you, I, I am of the belief that once they get to the peak rate or terminal rate, I think they're, I take the Fed out the word that they're going to stay there. But the market disagrees with me. Uh, where, where do you think? Do you think those those rate cuts will come uh, as soon as the market thinks? No, I, I agree with you. I think it's gonna. I think it's gonna take longer. I think the Fed is pretty clear that it wants to, uh, you know, try and wash as much inflation out of the system as it can. And I think it's pre quite prepared to keep rates higher for longer. However, uh, they will be cutting rates because that's what always happens. Now, I my view, as I as I've tried to make clear is that I think they're doing two things in terms of policy. One is a financial stability policy where, where the balance sheet is important, and the other is uh, an inflation control policy where they're using rates. So I think that's where you've got this sort of bifurcation or separation of policy. I don't believe that rates will be cut quickly, um, but on the other hand, I'm not in the camp that says there's going to be a deep recession. So I think there may be less need. And I think that you know, you've got, uh, you know, it looks like inflation is coming down kind of quite nicely anyway. Um, I'm not going to say it won't be volatile. I think it will be volatile. But uh, I think you've got that situation. Now, I think what you've got to start to factor in as well is the longer term. And if you get rate cuts in the US, uh, as people are thinking, the other thing to say is, well, what's going to happen to the term premium? Because if the term premium remains negative to the same extent, or even gets more negative, then you're going to make a lot of money out of government fixed income, right? Because effectively, policy rates will come down and uh, the bond market will reprice. But if you start to get those rate expectations or falls in rate expectations offset by rising term premium, then the whole thing's going to be a wash. You're going to not going to make a lot of money out of government fixed income. And that's what my view is, because I think there are pressures on. Uh, term premium to rise. And I think specifically those two pressures are number one, that you're going to start to see um, more issuance once we get the debt ceiling out of the way. Um, and secondly, I think what you're going to see is a fall off in the foreign demand for treasuries. And that's going to come really from two avenues. Number one, uh, Japan, because I think there is going to be increasing pressure on Japanese institutions to buy their own bond market, the JGB market, not the US Treasury market. And if you start to look at the maths of yield differentials, uh, we're pretty much at that point anyway, where you'd think they'd make a decent investment decision now back into JGBs. Uh, but I think there may be also some moral suasion from the authorities, as we know there always is in Japan. And the second thing is to factor into account what the Chinese are going to do, what the Saudis are going to do, et cetera, uh, in terms of their deployment of, uh, of reserves into US treasuries. And I think the evidence that we've got is that they are not going to be as aggressive buyers as they've been in the past. So you're going to have pressure uh, in terms of a supply demand uh, imbalance, which is basically favoring a, a, a higher 
or let's say a less negative term premium in the future. And that means that the bond markets, the government markets, will be, uh, I think, a wash through this year. Hence my view, it, it, they range trade, and that's partly uh, behind my view of why the stock market range trades, because basically uh, you know, the stock market gets a lot of its cue from fixed income. Mm. Uh, so, so far, we've really been focusing on policy liquidity, but that's only one of the sort of three legs of the the, the total liquidity stool that, that you, you and cross-border capital focus on, uh, the other being private sector liquidity and cross-border flows. H- how do you define these and what are, what are you seeing uh, in, are, these, are these, those aspects of liquidity also uh, rising or at least halting their decline? And then, um, yeah, I mean, cross-border flows is, is so complex. I know you, I, you have you know, very rare insights, so I'd love your, your view on that. But your know, private sector liquidity, I look at things like uh, the asset-backed securitization markets, which uh, you know, mm-hmm. are not as you know, uh, free-flowing as they were in 20, late 2020, early 2021, let's say, as well as the absolute sort of you know, nuclear winter, to use a dramatic word, uh, in the issuance, primary issuance market, it's particularly in the U.S. I, I don't follow you know, Europe that closely, but... Um, you know, IPOs are being canceled. SPAC deals are being canceled. Uh, bond uh, bond issuances are, are just not happening as much, and it's it's hurting. You know, Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan, the investment banking Jeffries, uh, uh, people who you know make a living by by making these deals happen. Um, but I don't know, you know, how much or to what degree that goes into your private liquidity. So yeah, what about private liquidity and, and cross border flows? Well, the answer is all those factors do go in. But let let me deal with the cross border flow uh, question first. Cross-border flows are, as the name suggests, um, basically flows of capital between economies. And um, you, you know, overall, for the world economy, that tends to be a wash. But for different markets, it can be clearly very important if money is moving in or moving out of a, a particular economy. Uh, what you're seeing, uh, or what, le- sorry, let me step back. What you have seen in much of the last 10 years, very unusually, are huge inflows into America. I say very unusually because what that te- you never tend to see such a trend break in capital flows of this magnitude. And really since uh, 2010 or the uh, end of the global financial crisis, uh, a lot of uh, money has flowed into the US. Uh, and as I say, that's unusual on that scale. It's normally more cyclical, um, uh, but this time it's trended. The reason it has really come down to three three reasons. First of all, there's been a shortage of safe assets in the global financial system, as we suggested or have already spoken about. And that's because Basel III, Solvency II, the increasingly tight regulations on uh, international banks and insurance companies has demanded that they hold more safe assets. The two primary safe assets in the world economy are the US Treasury note, the 10-year bond, and uh, German bunds. Uh, German bunds have been in particularly short supply, uh, particularly lately, uh, as the ECB in Europe has hoovered up uh, a lot of those uh, bunds uh, for its QE policy over the last two years. Of the total free float of the German 10-year bund, only 10% of it remains in the private sector. That's a a sort of an eye-wateringly small number. Uh, And therefore, there's been a lot of pressure to buy U.S. treasuries. So money has flowed into the U.S. for that reason. Secondly, what you've seen uh, is the China corruption clampdown by Xi Jinping in 2015-2016, which uh, forced a lot of money into U.S. dollars. And thirdly, you've got the background of the Eurozone banking crisis, which admittedly was around 2010-12, but it didn't uh, give a big fill in to dollar flows around that time. And then the COVID crisis, uh, demand for more safe assets uh, gave a further spur. So the US has had a perfect storm of capital inflows. It's beginning to lose momentum now. The dollar is coming down. and A lot of money is flowing into emerging markets for the first time in many years. So that's, you know, that's the point about cross-border flows. It's moving outside of the US and emerging markets are getting it, right? In terms of private sector flows, I mean, I've said already a lot about what's going on. Private sector flows really come from three main areas. One is uh, corporate cash flows. Um, They have been very buoyant, particularly through the COVID period as margins were high. 
and for example tech cash flow was particularly strong and they're beginning to fade now um and so that is clearly a, a short term negative uh bank lending growth which uh is um actually beginning to pick up but i rather suspect that may fade the reason it's picking up is it may well reflect uh prior commitments the banks made uh, when liquidity was abundant, they probably gave credit lines to a lot of corporations. And if the economy is slowing, you'd expect those credit lines to be taken up. And so you get an artificial pickup near term in bank lending. So that may explain that. And then if you look at shadow banking, shadow banking is very uh, is at the margin very important. Uh, it's clearly been a very big element in, in the markets in the last uh, 20 years. And shadow banking tends to be uh, tends to get a lot of its traction through the dollar. So if the dollar is weakening, shadow banking, particularly FX swap, uh, uh, tend to be a lot more popular. And another thing would be the bond volatility. So if bond volatility drops, which it has done, there's a lot more appetite for repo financing. Margins tend to come down. People are more willing to to uh, lend bond, uh, lend bonds or whatever. So in actual fact, what you've seen. Um, really in the last two to three months is a big step up in overnight repo financing uh, volumes. Uh, and that's been coincident with um, uh, declining volatility. So the private sector liquidity is a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, elements are coming down, elements are, are moving up. Uh, it, but generally what, what I would expect is the main momentum would really come through from the central banks in the in the first instance. Right. And uh, you know, noted uh, investors such as Steve Eisman, who was very successful shorting bank stocks uh, in 2008, in particular, you know, as well as buying credit default swaps. Um, you know, he recently said that he thinks the U.S. banking system is, is rock solid. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, do you agree with him? And then how do you estimate the health of the European banking system, uh, which faces a, a whole different host of challenges? Well, I mean, the, the answer is that I can only comment on what I see. I'm not a bank analyst. Uh, I look at liquidity and credit markets. And from everything I can see and everything I would instinctively feel, because the banks have been so regulated, they almost can't do anything wrong. Uh, I mean, they're almost walking around in handcuffs. So you can't really accuse them of creating a, uh, a crime here. So it looks that certainly the US banking system is in, uh, is in a great state of health. It's very difficult to make those comments about shadow banking simply because we don't know. I mean, there are there are dark areas that are hidden there and they're in the shadows by definition. So it's kind of hard to say. And that's why I think that if you look at how the monetary authorities control the shadow banking now, uh, the shadow banking system is much more through uh, ultimately controlling the collateral markets, which means effectively controlling yields and volatility in the sovereign debt markets. Uh, as regards the European banks, it's a hard one. Um, I, I'm not a great fan of the euro system, as you probably have heard me say before, uh, or of the euro, but I'll come quietly and accept the fact that it, its integrity remains. But I think it's a, a system that is in dire need of restructuring. And I think the, you know, the great problem that the euro area has is that like in any fixed exchange rate system, the rich countries get richer and the poor get poorer. And those wealth anomalies or income anomalies just, you know, basically uh, escalate or accumulate over time. And without a fiscal transfer mechanism, which they don't have in the uh, European Union, uh, you're going to basically embed uh, poverty uh, in Italy and Spain and Greece. And you basically, you know, under underscore uh, prosperity in the northern European states and their banking systems reflect that. So, you know, ultimately, uh, I'm not a fan. All right, Michael. So we've talked a lot about all sorts of uh, liquidity, particularly the, the balance sheet, so quantitative tightening. But what about rates? I, you know, I, last year, as the Federal Reserve was hiking rates, as they, as they hiked from 50 basis points to 75 or, you know, the little itty bitty rates, I, we, we heard all the time, there's no way uh, the system can take it. There's just too much debt. And, uh, you know, now interest rates are close to 5% and you know, they're, they're almost certainly going to get there, uh, you know, very likely going to get going to get to 5%. Do you think the global economy can take 5% rates? I mean, are there are there certain business models that uh, could only really exist when interest rates are, are, are close to, to zero? I mean, how, how serious of a threat do you think this high rates are in particular to, you know, uh, activity, uh, you know, 
the the car market, the the housing market, if it acts with a lag, you know, 12 to 18 months, wouldn't we only start to see the the negative economic effects of, of contracting credit, um, you know, right now and in, in, in 2023? I mean, the first thing to say is that they've taken 2% rates, they've taken 3%, they've taken 4%, uh, you know, maybe they'll take 5 too. I think it's it's very difficult to work out what the critical threshold is. I mean, our view is that what's a lot more important, uh, you know, which is our raison d'etre, is liquidity rather than uh, than rates. And I think that if you come back to uh, maybe two observations, which I think are worth again spelling out, the first of those is to say that with the huge amount of debt that we've got saddled with that's in the world economy, some 300 trillion, the world financial system is much more of a refinancing mechanism than a new financing mechanism. A new financing mechanism is basically what the textbooks tell us finance does. And in that world, interest rates are important. But this is basically not how the markets are operating. With a huge amount of debt pile that we've got, debt has to be refinanced. And with 300 trillion of debt, with an average life of about five years, what that means is you're refinancing, or trying to fund 60 to 65 trillion of debt every year. Now, if you think of the very you know small scale example of a home mortgage, if you've got a home mortgage which needs refinancing, you're desperate to find a bank that will basically roll that mortgage. You're not so worried about what the interest rate is because unless you get the roll, you're homeless. And that focuses the mind. And think about that in the context of financial markets. What you want is the roll because otherwise you get defaults. And the problem is that most of the last, uh, most last, most of previous financial crises in the last 20 years have been refinancing crises where you can't get these roles. So liquidity is all important because liquidity is a measure of balance sheet capacity. And what you need is lots of liquidity if you've got lots of debt. Now, what that means if you start to think this through generally is that if we're in a world where the debt to GDP ratio is going up, because interest rates uh, uh, allow debt to compound or force debt to compound, and GDP grows with a growth rate that is probably under some downward pressure, or it's certainly low, what you, what you get in that world is a rising debt to GDP ratio. Now, hold that thought. If you need liquidity to refinance debt, and the authorities keep pace with liquidity injections, the ratio between liquidity and debt should be pretty constant which means that the liquidity to GDP ratio is continuing to expand upwards, okay? And if the liquidity to GDP ratio is going up, that correlates one for one with PE multiples. So if you're getting rising liquidity to GDP, um, basically what you're looking at is an expanding multiple for equity markets. And that's something which is uh, you know worth thinking about. Now, why do I raise this point? Because ultimately what you we're in is a world where the amount of debt and debt refinancing has only got to grow because of swelling fiscal deficits. And this is something that has got to focus all our minds once we get over this inflation problem. Inflation problem is a minor problem in context, okay? It's the, it's the fiscal arithmetic that simply doesn't work. And what you are, are going to get is an environment where uh, entitlement spending is going to skyrocket over the next 10 years, and the tax base uh, is going to shrink because working age population falls away. And the gap has got to be filled somewhere. It's either filled by the federal authorities buying US treasuries, it's filled by foreigners buying treasuries, <clears throat> or it's filled by domestic institutions or retail buying US treasuries. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I would suspect that the sort of returns that you're going to be offered on treasuries are not that attractive for the simple reason that uh, if the higher the interest rates, the more that the debt uh, burden dis, uh, you know, amplifies anyway because of interest payments. So you've got to keep some sort of cap on interest rates, which is why I'm saying yield curve control has to be coming. And that would suggest that if, in this if this picture I'm painting is correct, where you want to be putting your assets is not in fixed income, uh, or certainly government fixed income, it's in things like equities, it's in real estate, it's in commodities, and it's probably in 
monetary hedges like gold and crypto. Those are the areas that are going to be far more immune to this world of yield curve control. I'm going to put a chart up just of GDP and liquidity, or maybe liquidity and uh, shipping activity, which is a great, a great chart as well. Um, and yeah, this just goes to show uh, how correlated they are. When liquidity goes up, uh, <laughs> there are a lot more ships going around the the, the ocean, the world's oceans, and when it goes down. Uh, as well, so this would indicate that we are at the beginning of a reflationary boom. So, so yeah, do you, I mean, do you think that economic growth will expand? Um, if so, I mean, that would would that be characterized as a no landing scenario where actually inflation and growth go go to even higher levels? Uh, or if you think inflation will be muted, is that a, a soft landing scenario? Because it, it sounds like your a uh, hard landing is you're thinking is quite unlikely. It, it sounds like I think the evidence is is against it. Yes, for sure. Uh, Let's never say never, but I think the evidence so far is against that. What that chart is basically trying to show is that the orange uh, bar chart is a composite that we constructed from all the major business surveys worldwide. So things like the US ISM survey, things like the the TANCAN in Japan, uh, things like the UK CPI business optimism survey, all these factors are thrown in. So we cover about 20 economies weighted by size. that's the orange bar. Now, look where we come from. On that uh, chart, we come from an index of around 70 to an index now of basically below 40. Uh, and if you can sort of squint at the chart and look at the latest January reading, you'll see there that actually there's been a big pickup uh, already. The uh, And that suggests that we've actually had a lot of the recession, surely. I mean, how much lower can it get? Uh, it clearly could get lower, but, you know, I mean, it'd have to be a pretty... Uh, damaging recession to actually get down there. Now, the other point is that the black line on that chart is looking at world shipping activity. It correlates very closely with GDP, not surprisingly. But part of the reason for putting that that line on there is that shipping is very liquidity intensive. You're not going to launch ships unless you can get credit. Uh, And that's the point. So if that index is bouncing up as well, it's telling us that there's more credit available in the world system uh, and that will fuel uh, future growth. I want to be re- respectful of your time, so let's, let's do sort of a, a, a lightning round. Um, now I'm going to flash up a, a chart which just shows uh, the amount of liquidity that's been where's the global money flowing, and the six month change uh, is is negative for a, a lot of places, uh, ne- negative for the world, but it has been absolutely flowing into China. So based on your liquidity model view, is is China where you are most bullish on in terms of? Uh, risk assets, uh, equities? Yes, broadly, that's correct. Absolutely correct. I mean, we, oh. we run a, uh, we or, uh, cross-border capital has a fund management division and the fund management division, which uses our liquidity data, uh, runs uh, an equity usage fund. Um, and that fund is actually, uh, what well, I do know, it's, it's overweight uh, Asia, but particularly China. Absolutely right. Uh, all right, now let's, thank you. Let's move on to the next chart. Uh, this plots risk appetite with the business cycle, business cycle in gray, risk appetite in orange. Interesting to see that risk appetite really didn't go down at all last year, according to, to your model uh, at cross-border capital. So um, on one hand, you have a bullish reading with liquidity have, having bottomed, you think, and you know on the rise. But if you still have a disconnect where the, the business cycle is, is well below risk appetite and, and risk appetite hasn't properly priced in the, the slowdown that we had last year, uh, how does that affect your view? Yeah, it's a, that's a, a very interesting point. I think if you look at that chart, <clears throat> basically what it's showing is the orange line is the risk exposure of investors. Uh, it comes from actual data of port- portfolio holdings. So it's not a sentiment indicator per se. It's looking at actual positioning. And if that is at zero asset allocation, let's just take a very simple 60-40 equity bond split. That's saying that investors are normally at their 60-40 point. Uh, If it's up at those high levels, it's saying that actually there's more of a skew into uh, risk assets than you'd normally see. And as you rightly infer, during a business cycle downturn, you'd expect to see lower exposure to equities and more exposure to fixed income. Now, I would suggest that uh, that chart may be right or it may be wrong in terms of uh, where people are positioned. I mean, clearly it's a fact they are positioned there. But what I'm saying is that why wouldn't it go down lower? Uh, Part of the reason may be that the data has been skewed because of a lot of QE 
uh, by central banks has actually removed a lot of uh, holdings of, uh, of debt or available debt. So it's pushed investors into risk assets more. That's a that's possible. It may be that the volatility that you've seen in the fixed income markets has caused people to stay into equities rather than move into fixed income. It may be that uh, fixed income are no longer the appropriate hedge, uh, or it may be that people are changing their structural asset allocations along the lines I suggested that would uh, because uh, the long term um, attractions of government fixed income are not there simply because of the threat of yield curve control that you really want to be better off out of the government debt markets into uh, equities generally. That may be a strategic decision. Now, I'll also say that if you drew that same chart, which we do for emerging economies, they are moving absolutely on track with the business cycle. As you'd expect, this is much more a developed market phenomenon. You have a strong view on growth that you know growth will uh, be strong. Uh, did you? Sorry, did you say uh, your view on inflation? Because you know, are, are you in the soft landing category or the no landing? You, I'm in a yeah. soft landing category. I think that I think you will see. I mean, you might see technical recession, but I think my view is that you've seen the bulk of the contraction already. And I, you know, the reason I say that you might get some recession is that. You know, some of the cyclical parts of the U.S. economy are clearly, uh, you know, weak and, you know, cycles are cycles. They'll go down more. Things like housing, things like durables, uh, things like CapEx, business equipment. I mean, they're clearly moving lower um, and they may continue to. Um, but I still believe that the landing is relatively soft compared to what the yield curve says or what a lot of economists are predicting. As regards inflation, I think that inflation is... Um, is likely in the this year to come back to very low levels. So I think it could be sub two percent at some stage. Uh, but that you know may be a, a fake flag because I think that you'll probably get a pickup in inflation on the other side because I think it's going to be more volatile than we've seen historically. So I think that you know we'll we'll be dancing around or above that two percent threshold over the next two or three years. Inflation's not going to go back to levels that we saw in the seventies. Uh, but clearly, we're we're well past the sort of deflationary period that we saw in the wake of China's entry into the WTO world trading system. Mm. Uh, well, Michael, as you referenced earlier, people can find your work on at on Twitter at at Cross Border Capital. I also really recommend your your book, uh, Capital Wars: The Rise of Global Liquidity. Uh, you go into the complex um, uh, topics that you we, we you know dove into today uh, in, in proper depth. And I, I also want to say that uh, it is from the index of this book when I was, you know, just came over to Blockworks, I wanted to uh, find a name for my podcast. I said, you know what, this book, Capital Wars, it's got a great book. I'm going to thumb through the index and find a phrase. Uh, and, and I did. So I found the phrase forward guides in here. And I said, oh, that's the, uh, as the perfect name. Um, so my final question for you, Michael, is, yeah, can you sum up your views on asset allocation, which you, you have discussed previously, um, in the context of this chart, which is uh, where we are in the liquidity cycle. There's uh, speculation and then turbulence. So we were in turbulence last year when uh, liquidity was uh, going down. Um, and But now you say, I think you say we were in a rebound where uh, liquidity is low, but it is rising. So what are the sort of assets that outperform in a rebound phase? And then uh, how, could you sort of take us from the rebound phase to the to the calm phase? Yeah, sure. I mean, we <clears throat> let's be clear that we're just on the cusp of moving away from turbulence into rebound. This chart is our asset allocation chart that comes from the liquidity cycle. Uh, it is approximately right, but by definition will be precisely wrong. Uh, but it gives you a flavor of where broadly you would be allocating. And as Jack says, we're currently in the top left-hand quadrant or just moving into that, inching into it. That is an area where uh, the sort of strategies tactically that make sense are what we've labeled here credit arbitrage strategies. So it's things like uh, high yield bonds. Uh, it's things like, uh, you know, I put distressed securities in there, but certainly fixed income arbitrage hedge funds are really where you should be making quite a lot of money. So sort of more complicated fixed income strategies uh, will be profitable simply because bond volatility comes down in that area. And that's what we're seeing right now. The, um, that's not to say that equities won't perform in that area or certain other assets won't go up. But what we're saying is that this is the prime type of uh, flavor 
of uh, of um, investments to make. That's where you've got the best risk return, uh, risk reward, uh, you know, trade off. The next phase up is calm, and that calm phase is normally associated with a period where liquidity is above average and rising, and that's where we label that directional. And that's where you want really as much beta as possible. Uh, you can go into equities, emerging markets. You want to go much more towards cyclical value type stocks. And that's where long, short uh, equity hedge funds really make a lot of their money. Uh, and we've just come out of the, you know, the volatility based area where you want to have a lot of cash, um, a lot of short dated bonds. The dollar does well in that phase. Uh, manage futures. Uh, things like CTAs are normally very good performers, and actually they've had a stunning year in the last twelve months. So that kind of uh, you know supports that conclusion. Mm. Well, very interesting, Michael. You are the master when it comes to liquidity, and uh, I, I knew I want I knew you had to come on uh, once you said that liquidity is turning because uh, you know if if you're right, this will totally change uh, the price action. Um, anyway, and perhaps it it, it already has. Um, you know, with the, with the stock market. Uh, roaring back. Uh, so, and you know, I, I, I really respect when people, um, you know, change your minds. And, you know, one of your pieces is called When the Facts Change. And, you know, liquidity was low and falling. And uh, that, you know, you, you were thought, you know, stocks would perform poorly, but, you know, the facts have changed. The, the Bank of China is injecting trillions of yuan. Uh, that's all you need to know. <laughs> Let's see in six months' time, you know. Uh, I yeah, know yeah, I'm we'll right. Or um, yeah. I've got to eat a lot of humble pie. <laughs> there we go. Well, Michael, thanks for sharing your, your insights and uh, thank you everyone for watching. Good. Thanks so much, Jack. It's been a great privilege. Forward Guidance, the program you just enjoyed, hopefully, can be viewed on YouTube at Blockworks Macro or heard as a podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Episodes are typically released on Apple and Spotify a few hours before they air on YouTube. So know that if you're someone who wants to listen to an episode as soon as possible. Please leave a review on Apple Podcast if you feel so inclined. Please check out today's sponsor, Curve, at link.curve.com slash forward underscore guidance. That's link.curve.com slash forward underscore guidance. You can get 10% off to Permissionless 2023 and Blockworks Research using code GUIDANCE10. Thanks again, and be well.